Good evening and welcome to a special uh, meeting of the Northampton School Committee. It's Wednesday, September 26, 2018. Um, I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair, and we'll begin by asking uh, the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Mayor David Narkowitz. Present. Ms. Molly Darna. Ms. Rebecca Pasansky. Present. Laura Fallon. Present. Ms. Ann Hexie. Present. Ms. Mr. Downey Meyer. Present. Mr. Howard Moore. Ms. Susan Ball. Present. Mr. Ezahowski. Present. Okay, we have a quorum. We have a quorum. Okay. Um, is there anyone who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay. <laughs> so there's no one who wishes to speak in public comment, so we'll go on to announcements. Are there any announcements from the school committee? Ms. Um, we've all been invited to join um, Holyoke, Springfield, Brockton, and Worcester Public Schools for a community forum. It's called A Tale of Four Cities, an evening of advocacy and coalition building around Chapter 70 funding issues. Um, it's Tuesday, October 9th, 5.30 till 7 p.m. at Holyoke High Dean Campus in the cafeteria. They're encouraging all elected officials, district leaders, parents, and members of the community to attend, participate in the public comment period, and listen to the next action steps. Um, Senator, I'm sorry, State Representative um, Vega will be speaking, and there will be an overview of the issues um, by the MASS and MASC. Um, and then a focus on organizing and communication planning. So I would urge anyone who's available to go back and forward the information too. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Any other announcements? School committee? Okay. Uh, so we have a, um, a consent agenda this evening that, approved, that includes the approval of minutes of September 13th. Um, and actually, the July 12th minutes were not available at press time, so those are not going to be on the consent agenda. Um, and then two field trip requests, Jackson Street School, fifth grade, going to Nature's Classroom in Beckett, Massachusetts, October 9th through the 12th. Um, and the Bridge Street School, fifth grade, going to Nature's Classroom in Charlton, Mass, November 13th through the 16th. Um, is there any items that people wish to? I would move to open the consent agenda. Um, with the exception, uh, and I'd like to pull the September 13th school committee minutes. Okay. Did you have a I was going to say the same thing. Perfect. Okay. Would you second? I'll second. Okay, great. So this would be a, a, a vote just on the consent agenda, effectively on the two field trip requests that are on the, uh, on the, on the consent agenda. But yes, Ms. Ross. I'm fine with that, but can I make a comment? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I got through half of the, the meeting notes, and I just wanted so I don't have to say it next meeting. Can I offer a slight modification now so that? Well, I think we're going to get right to the minutes after oh, we're, gonna... we're voting on the consent agenda. Then we'll Thanks. talk about Got the it. Minutes. Got it. That's yeah. fine. Thank you. Because that's the, she's pulling it off the agenda. Got it. Um, so all those in favor of the consent agenda, which is the two natures classroom trip, <coughs> please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So now we come to the question of the of the September 13 minutes. Um, can I, I guess I would first defer to the person who wanted them pulled off and then I'll That's go fine. to other concerns. So it wasn't a specific um, question I had so much as a general. Um, last month we approved um, the updated policy BEDG on minutes and one of the notes that we added at the end was how specific comments and or discussion should only be included in the minutes as a result of a vote of the committee. And so I was hoping that, I, I felt that these were um, perhaps uh, overly detailed, which I appreciate, <laughs> but I wonder that um, we should just be writing the actions taken, particularly the public comment period summaries um, and so summaries um, of discussions that were made. Uh, because I feel like when we choose what to put in and which comments to include that we're somewhat editing it, I would rather we just stick to the actions that were taken. Okay. Response? Um, I had a somewhat different comment, but it, it was to add something. Um, but I think it is an action, and I will admit I did not, the reason, I, one of the reasons I'm in favor of taking these off and postponing them no matter what is I haven't had a chance to read it all. Okay. Um, so I did get to part of it and where we talked about the budget to fund the math study. 
I, my memory is that we s expect there to be a request for proposal coming back to us in October, and I think that should probably be reflected here because that is an action of some sort. Okay. Ms. Busanski, did you have a question? I was also just going to ask if we could uh, push off the vote till next month because, or next meeting, because I haven't had, I didn't have a chance to read them. Okay. So. Okay. But since they came out so right. late, which I completely understand, some could look at it as they came out so fast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, then, um, could I then just have a motion to postpone consideration of these bills? Move to postpone consideration of the September 13th minutes until our next meeting. Yeah, which I don't. A second. October 11th. October 11th. Yeah, I know we have a meeting, but it's at a retreat, so I didn't want to postpone them to that. So October 11th. Okay. Second. Seconded. Okay. Well, any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that um, that action is postponed until our next regular meeting. Um, next, we have a vote to accept a gift um, uh, from the Jackson Street PTO uh, for the aforementioned nature's uh, classroom field trip. And I don't know, uh, Principal Agma is here. If you want to uh, mention, discuss it, it's uh, $1,163.60 from PTO to fund. So this is our, the effort that we make, and all the schools do to leave no child behind, mm -hmm. and for going to nature's classroom. So the PTO is committed always to making up any shortfall, and also this is, reflects some of the fundraising that the fourth grade families did to make sure that their kids this year could go to nature's classroom. So it's a combination of that, the fundraising and the PTO. Make a, uh, I move to accept the gift in the amount of $1,163.66 from the Jackson Street PTO to fund bus transportation. Second. Second. Okay. Any other questions or discussion about this gift? Okay. All those in favor of approving the acceptance of the gift, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The gift is gratefully accepted. That's the word. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and actually, you may not want to leave. Um, there's a, <laughs> the next item is another gift from yes. Jackson Street uh, PTO. Um, and this is a $15,000 gift for supply shortfall. Mm -hmm. um, this, uh, the, there's a history to this. It actually goes back to 2003 when we had major budget cuts mm -hmm. in the Northampton schools um, that did uh, eliminate assistant principals at the elementary school, eliminated school librarians at the elementary school, um, eliminated aides on the, rec the recess and lunch aides. It was a kind of a Saturday night massacre kind of event. And over the years, the PTO has tried to make up for, they were committed at the time and continue to be to try to make up for the shortfall that we suffered then and we continue to have in terms of the kinds of needs that teachers have that they can actually donate to rather than fund any positions, which can't happen that way. So because of the ways that we need to identify funds that come into our schools now, uh, officially, we, I talked to the PTO and I said, we need to do this officially to make sure that we are um, very transparent about how funding happens in our school and therefore they were able to commit a certain amount of money that they'd like to, to support the teachers in all the ways that they can't fund things in their classrooms. And there have been so many studies about how many teachers fund their classrooms to the, I think the average when we did a survey in this district, it was about $1,000 a year that teachers spend on, of their own. So again, the PTO decided that they really wanted to step up and be very public about that they wanted to, to support the teachers. Would you accept the gift in the amount of $15,000 from Jackson Street PTO to fund supplies? Second. Second. Is there any comments or questions? or? 
Only to say that it's remarkable what our PTOs do throughout the district in this evening in regards to Jackson Street School and the generosity. Recognizing the need of teachers to help students in the classroom, I think, is just um, just a testament to the wonderful parents that we have here in Northampton mm -hmm. that are so willing to do so much to support their children in the classroom. So yeah. thank you very much. Well, I think that we really do think that we couldn't do it without them at this point, and we really couldn't. So and it's really important. So thank you. And I will pass that along as well. Appreciate that. Okay. So all those in favor of accepting the gift, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So um, I believe that concludes the Jackson Street gift portion of the agenda. So thank Good. you very much. Thank you for holding another meeting to no, I know that the, address this. And yeah, one of the, the October 9th, obviously, departure was going to be a problem since our meeting was October 11th. Uh, yeah, it yeah. would be a little. <laughs> so, appreciate being able to go. Okay. No problem. All right, thanks a lot. Okay, so um, the next item on the agenda is a report from the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. Um, and this is on um, second readings. Um, on various policies, so I'll turn it over to Ms. Fallon. Um, yes, this is a second reading and we'll be voting on um, policy AE revised public complaints. Mm -hmm. It's part of an effort to consolidate um, the three policies, well, four policies that we had um, and update them. And so I know that we have read the entire policy and that you all have it and we have discussed it, but I didn't know if there was any more discussion before we voted on public complaints revised. Any other further comments from the last meeting? Okay. There don't seem to be any, so we want to make a motion on that. We can move to approve um, policy KE public complaints revised. Second. Okay. This has been a motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the policy, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that policy is, is approved on second reading. Um, do we need to vote to eliminate these policies individually, or can they be taken as a group? I would, I would suspect that the committee would entertain them as a group. Okay, um, so this would be a second reading and vote to eliminate policies KEB, public complaints about school personnel, KEBR, public complaints about school personnel, and KEC, public complaints about the curriculum or instructional materials. As they've all been integrated into the new policy KE that you just voted to approve. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. Are there any complaints about this motion? I have Sorry. I have no complaint, but I just have a question sure. to understand how it works. So these I understand going through the policies and there's old dates on them. Is the wording on these things that MASC is suggesting or are ours different from other districts? Um, so MASC gave us guidance to, up, to consolidate and update these policies and they had suggested wording and because it's um, Mr. Moore and Ms. Hennessy and myself, we opted to use our own wording. <laughs> so ours is not identical to the MASC recommendations. But that's helpful. So, but they're telling us to get rid of those three. Yeah, and they were telling us to consolidate. Of yes. Others. Okay, thanks. That's what I figured. I just... All right. So... Motion's been made and seconded. Any other discussion? Okay, so all those in favor of um, the elimination of the three now outmoded policies, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so um, that elimination is approved on second reading. Um, next, we have a discussion and vote on selecting a delegate to represent the school committee at the MASC. Um, conference in Hyannis, November 7th through the 10th, 2018, um, and, and then uh, whether or not to give guidance to said delegate on the resolutions that are being put before the delegates. So, um, yes, Ms. Musansky. Uh, I'd like to nominate Ms. Fallon as our delegate. Okay. Excellent. Second. Okay. You were planning to attend. I yeah, but I just started <laughs> months ago. Excellent. She um, is now. So there's been a motion made and seconded to nominate Ms. Fallon to be our delegate. Is there anyone else, any other nominations that, okay. Um, so 
All those in favor then of approving uh, Ms. Fallon to be our delegate to actually vote on our behalf at the uh, conference, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? And then, I guess now that you're the delegate, um, do you want to now <coughs> seek guidance on these um, policies? And, it, and I think it says restrictions attached, but right. I think it meant resolutions attached. I think the copies of the 13 resolutions mm -hmm. were were attached. But if mm -hmm. we want to put restrictions on this, that may not be a bad idea. Um, so I, I would like to get just a little input. I don't want to drag out what should be a fairly short meeting. but. Um, just to be, so I was a part of the resolutions committee, um, and so I've already amended some of the original resolutions and um, and then had to vote on them again as at the MASC Board of Directors meeting um, for Division 5, and once again fought to amend some of them. But now that I'm a delegate representing our districts, I would like to have some feedback. Obviously, there's no way of knowing what happens on the floor of the assembly. You've got hundreds of people all jumping up to give amendments. Um, but just to get a general feel for some of them. Um, and some of these, while they seem sort of, um, they don't seem necessary for Massachusetts, for example, Resolution 1, rejecting the army of, um, arming of educators, they actually are really important when we go to the um, National School Board Association Conference to have, be on the record as saying we oppose this so that then they can argue um, for things at the federal level. Sorry, John. Oh. I'm waiting, I'm not recognized. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 I was like, am I saying something wrong? Yeah. Um, and so, so that, just to give you that perspective on it, so does anyone have feedback on resolution one that I should, I'm assuming? <laughs> yes. Could I be recognized? So, um, if you recall, I attempted to organize this somewhat like a consent agenda by asking people if they had ish, uh, specific resolutions that they had objections to that yeah. might be uh, helpful. Um, so I did receive two um, specific requests. One was for, they're both from Ms. Burnham. One was for discussion on resolution eight and uh, the concern that she brings up is whether there is a moral concern about students, about schools accepting money from wagering as part of their funding stream. And then the other one was number nine. She wanted to know about how the changes would affect our special education team, our budget, and special ed services in the district. And those were the two resolutions that I actually fought or argued against and made some changes to at the, at the resolutions meeting. So I, I mean, do you only want to address the ones there's questions on? Or should we just get a quick sense? I think the goal of it was to not to not go through all of them? Discuss yeah. them all, but to see if any any jumped out at members. Okay. That they had so about. the sports wagering initially was supporting sports wagering, and like that was the statement. And the amendment I made was to say it be, that it was resolved that should the general court enact legislation to legalize wagering on sporting events, the general court shall commit a portion of the revenues generated from sports wagering to public education. For exactly that reason, I worried that coming out in favor of sports wagering seemed a little strange and uh, I struggled with it. I understand that we need revenue, but preying on some of our most vulnerable populations, I feel like in the, just to get revenue, I feel like in the wrong, long run could end up costing us money. Mm -hmm. And so I posed encouraging the, the, the general court to, to legalize it, but I did not stand firm against um, if they, to say if they do, that we should then ask for a portion of the So was Ms. Burton concerned that schools. that was like, that it was a moral position I vote. to not take the money? Yeah, should yeah, we have no sales? I'd like to understand more about money coming to schools from gambling, AKA sports wagering, and how we feel about this as a school committee. Okay. Yes. I have a question. Do sure. we currently get funded through lottery? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lottery and soon casinos will mm -hmm. be generating so this is a much bigger issue. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, I, so I just didn't want to go in with yeah. my own opinion and argue mm -hmm. when I don't know how the rest of the committee feels about taking a stand one way or another, or whether you think we shouldn't even be taking yeah. a stance on it. I think the horse is out of the barn in terms of uh, you know, games of chance. <laughs> 
And is this something we see coming down the pike? Yes. Is that why we're There's a huge gotcha. discussion about it. Because mm -hmm. there was a now, recent yeah, a Supreme Court decision. Supreme yeah. Court decision. So right. some states are, are rushing forward on it. But in Massachusetts, have we mm -hmm. begun to move on it? Um, nothing's Our legislature. Been filed yeah. yet. I think they're mm -hmm. waiting probably till after the election. Mm -hmm. Right. Anything, but um, it does open the door to do it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not that there's not sports wagering going on now. It's right. It's just it's right. not being done above the table and being taxed. And, you know, mm -hmm. so there's there's an argument to be made about mm -hmm. it, whether legalizing it would, right. would root out corruption and, and also generate revenue. So, mm -hmm. so anyway. Has Mask, uh, take, did Mask take a stance on, do we know, on the casinos before they were legalized or on marijuana before it was legalized, the tax revenue generated by marijuana? It's challenging, other? yeah. I mean, Generally, organized labor was in favor of the casinos because it was <laughs> jobs and trade, and mm -hmm. so I don't I don't recall there being any opposition mm -hmm. specifically. Or a mask resolution. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember that, but I was opposed. But you know. mm -hmm. so, so it's, how does the committee, in general, thinks that this is sort of an inevitability and that we should? So all the th resolution is saying is that like that. So right now, what it's saying is that if it's legalized, we should get a portion of it. And so the arguments in the room were that we shouldn't be taking a stance at all. That we shouldn't be saying that we're in favor of it. That if it does indeed pass, that then's when we that is when we stand up and say, hey, we'd like a portion of the proceeds. And then the other side w was arguing pretty strongly that we should say that urge them to legalize it. And so this was sort of the compromise position, yeah. but I'm assuming that there will be changes made on the floor of the assembly. Um, yeah. And so I just didn't know. I didn't. I didn't know how to vote. <laughs> so, for, of the people that are here, and Ms. Burns not here, is there any strong sense that we should be opposed to this, or encourage our delegate not to? I mean, I read. I recognize that things can change on the floor very quickly, so you just need one amendment and the whole tone changes. I feel comfortable uh, that with this resolution as it's stated. It okay. feels like maybe it's unnecessary. I don't know if there's precedent for this or not, but if there, you know, maybe it makes sense to say, it doesn't seem to be saying that we're for sports wagering, just that if there's sports wagering and it generates revenue, we schools should have a piece of it because we're so badly unfunded. But if that changes to, of what the initial resolution to was. saying like we encourage or, yes. or urge then I uh, then I would have a problem okay. more of a problem with that I guess I'd want to look into it more it, yeah. it's strange to make a resolution okay. Okay. as it is I'm fine with it okay um, and then the other one was resolution 9 access to information for parents and students who are clients of special education I fought pretty hard against this against this I did speak with people from our special education department. The current law is that um, that each person conducting an assessment shall summarize in writing the procedures employed, the results, etc. Um, but that summaries of assessments shall be completed prior to the discussion by the team and upon request. Right now, the law is only upon request do those assessment results get mailed to families. And then it says that it should be made available to the parents at least two days in advance of the team discussion. Um, and so what they're proposing is making this mandatory that those results of those, the assessments are always sent either by email or mail and that they um, are sent out five days in advance. Um, and they were unwilling to, um, I initially passed an amendment and then it got overthrown. Um, they were also unwilling to waver on the um, in the family's preferred language whenever possible. They took out the whenever possible language. So I just feel like this is this is another unfunded mandate. It's going to cost our district money. Um, I understand the group that was proposing this was um, a co kind of a informal coalition of urban districts um, that are very concerned that students aren't getting their parents are not getting the information they need in time to understand it and prepare for the um, IEP meetings. Um, but I do worry about the results it would have, the impact it would have on our district. But it's a resolution requesting that DESE change regulations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, the, okay. that they're asking to change the law. Okay. 
Yeah. But they're actually asking for state law. State law. Legislature. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which then, I assume, direct SC can do it, not really give really SC the flexibility mm -hmm. to do fine mm -hmm. Do you have thoughts on this? Yes, I'm strongly opposed as a former special education director. Um, one of the parts of our procedure was always to ask the parent if they wanted to receive the evaluations prior to the team meeting, and if they said yes, we did. If they said no, we didn't. There were many times when parents said no, um, especially since this is a cyclical process. It happens every three years. Um, parents, I think, get um, familiar with interpreting these results as they're presented at team meetings, and so they don't always want to have them or don't always require them um, before the meeting. I would say to the point um, that this may have been brought forward from a number of districts that have difficulties with compliance, that there are a number of mechanisms that are available for uh, the protection of individuals with disabilities um, with respect to this right now. If it is a widespread district, you know, complete district failure to provide assessments when requested by parents, there is always the Office for Civil Rights, which can investigate um, claims that, that civil rights are being denied. If it's um, a problem that is somewhat less um, pervasive, there's the um, PQA system through the Massachusetts Department of Education, which will also investigate complaints that districts aren't doing um, what is needed. Um, so if there are people who want to receive assessments that aren't receiving assessments, I think there are remedies available now. Um, it seems like this is a resolution that would require districts to also provide assessments to parents who don't necessarily want to have them. Um, so I, I, I would be opposed to it. And it will, it will it'll affect operations. Um, it, it's more postage, it's more, um, I mean, one of the things that was um, done through that negotiation with parents about whether or not they wanted to receive the assessments prior to the meeting is it helped us with scheduling. Um, so um, we could get more meetings in, we could get students with eligibility determinations more quickly because sometimes we knew that we had an extra day or two to finish assessments prior to the meeting. If um, under this we're um, sending them out five days in advance, what it means is that we're probably not going to be scheduling as many meetings. Um, I agree with everything that's been said, especially the unfunded mandate part, but I do have one other thing to add. And um, before I add that, I don't know if it's the current law, but I would think that, parent, that we would want to be sure what you said actually happens. Parents are offered in their language, if possible, a report. And so that is the law. Thank you. Um, the other thing that struck me about this is requiring um, really personal information to be mailed or emailed is... Um, Something, like I'm the one that keeps getting worried about emails getting stolen, right? But I'm going to bring it up again because in August, if people read this, um, the ACT, kind of the similar to the SAT but a different test, um, was, was, I don't know if they were found or accused of selling um, special ed reports on children or accommodations um, to colleges. So. These things do get out there, and I think if I could imagine if parents did not ask for it to be mailed or emailed, and it was sent, I think it's raining. Yeah. Oh. Um, Quite dramatic. Would the school be held responsible for for this very personal information um, in the IEP or the 504 to get in the wrong hands? So I think there's a risk there too. So did you oppose this? It's Final form without mm -hmm. being okay. But I, okay. there were too many votes in favor of it. Okay. Yeah. I'm with you. I just do think it is complicated, and I understand what you're saying. I do think that sometimes parents don't understand how important those reports mm -hmm. are, and they say, no, no, it's okay. Um, and that if it wasn't a funding issue, I think we would want to encourage parents to receive those reports and read them because they're so essential to understanding what's going on with their child. So I get the funding, and I get the bureaucracy, and the scheduling, I, I think we could maybe be better at scheduling, but I get why this came up, and, I, and I'm not as strongly opposed to it, but I, I'm with you on it, but I do think it's a little bit more complicated, so. And that was one of my, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, that was the, uh, the other point, though, that I made during that meeting was that just getting this, like, there are plenty of people who, in their native language and, you know, 
don't understand technical jargon. And so to me, it would have been more important to have an interpreter speaking their native language in the actual IEP meeting explaining the assessment results um, than having those results sent to them two or five days in advance. Because I feel like maybe we're focusing on the wrong thing. And so I don't know whether it would be an advocacy issue or if it's interpretation, but I, I think that there could be something else done to, to end up with a better end result. Mr. Meyer? And then I just have questions question about current practice because the first is that is the is the CPAC and the school district doing an adequate job in terms of informing informing parents of their rights um, under the you know under IDEA uh, and the second is what is our current practice in terms of making reports available because just noticing that the federal regulations allow school districts up to 45 days I'm hoping that we don't take 45 days to turn around a request, but I would assume that that's one of the impetuses is that, is that districts can, can place this at a very low priority and delay meetings or say, oh, well, we'll get it to you a month later. I just was wondering what the current, to answer both questions in terms of current practice. Uh, so that with respect to provision of assessments to parents in their um, preferred language. That is one of the areas that's reviewed in the coordinated program review. The district was found to be implementing that requirement. With respect to timelines, um, that also is a part of the coordinated program review. There were some findings for the district on timelines. Um, it was not timelines based on delay of turning around paperwork to parents to seek consent. It was the backlog of students in the queue waiting for assessments and not sufficient uh, evaluators, which is a, is a common um, kind of finding. Not acceptable, but common. I did want to throw out, if I may, while I have the floor, that um, the comment about having assessments interpreted in um, at, the, at the team meeting was also a part of the practice that I observed when I was a special ed director that I thought parents found maybe more helpful because a lot of parents said, I don't really need the report, but if there's something surprising in it, I'd like you to go over it with me and help me expl understand it before the team meeting. And that was something that we um, definitely provided as a service for parents. I understand maybe that doesn't happen everywhere, but I, I think that was more of a benefit to a lot of parents than just getting you know, reports in the mail that they might have difficulty understanding. Okay, so does that give you a sense of the committee? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is there are there any other resolutions that people took issues with or thought were problematic? Uh, I'm yeah. curious about what your thoughts are about the I don't remember the number the abolishing the Department of Education. What kind of resolution? You know, I feel like that was reactive and very time specific, okay. to be honest. Okay, great. I think that it was it just the, like it. the timing of it, but I think that it was just um, when they talked about it, they said they would like to work with the federal delegation to reject any notion. So I think that's another issue that they will just, okay. I think various states are working together to make sure that if it becomes an issue, that they have, they're on the record. Thank you. Okay, so does that. Um so we've elected our delegate and we've given our delegate guidance um, for the November conference. Any other questions or updates from rules and policy? Oh, yes. Well, I was just going to say I think it's interesting what I learned by attending last year, and I'm sorry I can't go this year, is that uh, you know we as a school committee could propose a resolution. It's just something to keep in mind for the future that we don't just have to. Framingham looks like they're the most vocal resolution, but anyway, something to keep in mind for the future that if we had something we felt strongly about, we could move that process along. And that's one of the things that they're voting on, is to change that deadline to June 1st, July 1st. So we'll have to just remember. OK. Excellent. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the, uh, um, is the update on subcommittee assignments. Um, as you know, at our last meeting, um, due to the change in our rules and our um, subcommittee policies, um, we uh, uh, changed our standing subcommittees to be uh, to be the 
budget and property rules and policy and superintendent evaluation and obviously the curriculum committee was uh, removed as a as a committee as a standing subcommittee um, the goal of this was to there's three standing subcommittees and there's nine members and so to have a member on each uh, you know each member having an opportunity to serve on one standing committee that's sort of how the math works out um, I did reach out to the um, the impacted members um, to get their input on their sort of preferences um, basically uh, there were two members who were left without any committee, uh, not serving on any committee. That was Ms. Voss and Ms. Burnham. Um, uh, Mr. Kaufman was already on two committees, so he was not affected, but I did survey Mr. Kaufman in terms of what his um, preferences were um, in a perfect world. And then the other members that were on um, two standing committees were Mr. Zahowski and um, Ms. Hennessy, I also spoke with them um, to understand uh, because obviously their stepping off a committee would facilitate um, a space for one of the two displaced members to serve. So all that and obviously trying to do the minimum amount of disruption, um, I've put together a memo which just updates the, um, the committees. Um, I'll, I'll just basically read the changes, which the only real changes are to the standing subcommittees. There are no changes to any of the other assignments, the, you know, the assignments to the legislative liaison, the parliamentarian, the PTO, like none of those changed. It really was just those three standing committees. So for budget and property, um, the three members that I'm appointing to that committee are Ms. Busansky, um, Mr. Meyer and Ms. Voss to budget and property. Um, rules and policy uh, a actually remains unchanged. Ms. Fallon, Ms. Hennessy, uh, and Ms. Moore. And then superintendent evaluation. Um, uh, the only change there is that Ms. Burnham replaces um, uh, Ms. Hennessy, who's stepping off of superintendent evaluation, um, and obviously Mr. Zahowski would be take would be stepping off of budget and property to make way for Ms. Voss. So that then aligns us. We have three, you know, each each of the members are on at least one of the standing committees, and then again, all the other assignments remain the same. So I did the sort of the update on the memo and I'll just send it around and it'll be online and we'll I'll have um, all the other things will be updated. So that's is this your way out of getting getting out of being chair? Well, I've been deferring to you for the last few months. So yeah. best of luck. Um, so that's the um, those are the updated assignments. The um, the next order of, um, well, there is no new business tonight. Uh, we do have a uh, rules and policy subcommittee meeting scheduled for Thursday, October 4th at 3.30 p.m. in the superintendent's office. Um, our next regular school committee meeting is October 11th, 2018, here at 7.15 in the community room. Um, and then we have um, a school uh, it should say school committee retreat. Yeah, it shouldn't say alt. It's just a school committee retreat meeting uh, uh, on October 25th, 2018 from 6 to 9 p.m. And the location is still to be determined. We'll get that out, obviously, in plenty of time for the posting. Yeah, we have the same question. Do we have a student advisory committee? Uh, advisory committee, which yeah, starts yeah. not at 6. What time is yes, it? Yes, I think so. 645? 645. 645. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, will we should we try to reschedule that to a different meeting or? No, I, I think they're just saying that that we should also have post or listed as future business a student advisory meeting to immediately precede the school committee meeting on October 11th. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll is that what that SAC is? Yeah. It's a school yeah. committee meeting SAC. Okay. Yeah. Great. So that we'll have to update that. Um, in the actual posting. This is obviously just for informational purposes, but thank you for pointing that out. Um, so um, we do have a um, 
we do have a need to have an executive session. Um, and so I will ask the chair to uh, make a motion regarding the executive session that's on the agenda. As the vice chair, I will uh, and uh, make a motion to enter into executive session in the JFK Library on Massachusetts General uh, Open Meeting for the approval of executive session minutes, July 11, 2016, July 12, 2016, August 19, 2016, September 8, 2016, September 15, 2016, September 28, 2016, October 3, 2016, October 13, 2016, November 9, 2016, November 10, 2016, November 28, 2016, December 8, 2016, December 21, 2016, January 4, 2017, February 8, 2017, June 8, 2017, July 13, 2017, August 10, 2017, October 12, 2017, November 9, 2017, January 11, 2018, February 8, 2018, March 8, 2018, March, uh, May 10, 2018. In Chapter 38, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining NACE, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect on the school committee's negotiating position. Okay. So that's a motion. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Okay. Um, this requires a roll call vote. Um, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Um, uh, yes. Yes. Ms. Laura Fallon? Yes. Ms. Ann Hennessy? Yes. Uh, Mr. Donnie Meyer? Yes. Ms. Susan Bob? Yes. Mr. Edward Sahel? Yes. Um, so uh, the committee has voted to go into executive session. I need to announce to the public that we will now move to executive session because to have these discussions in an open session is detrimental to the, to, the, um, to the bargaining position of the school committee. I also need to announce that we will adjourn directly from executive session and not return to open session. So we will now move into um, executive session. Thank you.